Okay. Hi, everybody. We are having a small crowd, which we're used to in this room, which is great. Um, we always have really good discussions in these small crowds, and this is meant to be an interactive session. So we'll be able to chat with you. So I'm going to introduce to you our speaker, which is Merha Kahava. Yeah. Great. And she's the CEO of Avista, which is a micromobility data platform. She's the chair of the Moss Alliance Data Model Subgroup uh, in the Technology and Standards Working Group. And uh, Merha has extensive global project experience ranging from technical leadership to cloud data platforms to API ecosystems. She loves language, not only English, French, and Dutch, but also Python. So I will present to you Merha, who will be talking about Avista and her data platform, and we will have some demos, and it will be interactive. So if you have any questions at any time, please don't hesitate, and we will, we will take them. Thank you. So thank you for, so much for attending this session. We are going to now look at what can you do with the GPS speeds, and especially what you can do around the world with the data. I will now talk from experiences, what does it take and actually what, what can you get when you are integrating data from around the world using GPFS? Um, and I will also give some kind of experiences, what you encounter when you try to integrate the data and also maybe some tips if you are producing data for GPFS. And especially what happens when you try to use data from different country. And we are also going to look at some of the numbers. For example, how many countries actually produce GPFS data? How many cities? How many systems? The numbers are pretty surprising, I can tell. So let's first look at some of the places where GPFS is really in use, in life use. And then we will look at insights from the cities, and we can go through your preferred cities where you come from, so we can pick any of those cities which are included in the platform. And we will also look at forecasting, which means that if you want to find a share bike nearby, do you always just look at the current data, or can you actually see if there are any bikes left when you leave your work? in two hours. And also some tips, kind of how to make the life easier for GPFS user. Um, this is a global map, and all these points represent cities which are actually producing GPFS feed. You can see that there are cities from North America, Europe, South America, even New Zealand has GPFS feeds. And Asia, there were a handful of cities in India. They are not working right now, but this is truly a global system. Um, I would like to actually you to guess that how many cities are actually producing GPFS data. Do you have any guesses? Is it 100, 200? Let's see. Let's see. It's actually more than 300 cities around the world. So this is pretty remarkable number. And there are cities which have multiple um, producers using GPFS, and some cities which only have one, one kind of system using it. And if we look at the docked stations, shared bikes with the docks, do you have any idea how many docks are connected to GPFS? Thousands. Lots. I think we are talking more than thousands. <laughs> it, it's actually more than 50,000 docks. But if, if you try to think about the number, that's how many bikes are actually connected, shared bikes are connected. The GPFS. Are we talking about 100,000 or what's your estimation? Is it million? It's actually more than half a million bikes or uh, shared bikes are producing data for, for GPFS. Uh, those feeds are, which are actually working. And if we would take into account 
scooters and free floating bikes, the numbers would be much, much more. So, so the right hand numbers, these are actually, actually for shared bikes with the dogs. Uh, if we look at the geographical distribution of the bikes, the United States has the biggest number of systems producing GPFs. And this is quite kind of normal because GPFs originated from the United States, so that's where it grew up. But if you look at France, it's the second one, uh, around 50 systems are now producing GPFS data. And we heard earlier today that uh, the French government is actually actively actually enforcing for shared bikes and, and also scooter systems to, to produce data in GPFS format. Uh, if you look at Germany, that's almost the same number as in in France, it's similar to the cities are kind of recommending, even enforcing the usage. There are some surprising countries like Norway um, has 30 different systems producing data, and this is because Norway's government is demanding that even scooters would be would have to produce produce. GPFS format with data. When you say they're being required to produce GPFS data, does that also mean that they're being required to make that GPFS data available to uh, third-party consumers, uh, developers, applications, etc.? <laughs> that's a good question because that's a question of open data versus proprietary data. Uh, at least in Norway, they are demand required to produce the data as open data. And in France? Uh, in France, actually, I don't know if, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, that's in the case. In France, yes, there's a new law that was passed last year. Yeah. That it must be open. Yeah, and you can find it all on the French national access point. Yeah. And you can see the other countries on, on the top of the list are, are from Europe. And that's kind of Europe is really much moving towards open data to make the data available so that it can be really used. Uh, there are some surprising, I, I, was, I had to actually check the C chat, that's the um, Czech Republic in Middle Europe. I was surprised to see, the, see it so high here. Um, yeah. We are going to have some other numbers from different angles, so this is the number of systems um, producing GPFS data so that it's actually visible. There are much, much, I'm sure there are more systems who produce GPFS, but it's not kind of easily accessible or in part of the catalogs. And here is kind of the same number of systems from different angles, so you can see the Middle Europe has the biggest number, so Central Europe, Southern Europe is dominating here. And the second one is the Paris, that's the Central European time. Um, New York, quite big, the East Coast, and Eastern time is on, also on the East Coast. Uh, West Coast for Los Angeles time, and the other values are distributed around, across different time zones. Um, let's go through the slides and then we can go look at the demos. demos. So let's look at some numbers from cities. And these are now shared bikes having docks and which are, have the biggest capacity. The capacity means that how many shared bikes are produced by, by a specific system. The city bike is from New York City. <laughs> New York City. Um, Velip Metropole is from Paris. So France is here. Quite strong. Divi is from Chicago. 
lift scooters as well, Chicago, or something from the United States that bigger cities have kind of permissions for for the shared bikes and scooters, and that's why you see even numbers on on specific cities, like Chicago is one of the examples. Um, Montreal is actually fifth largest system, and you can see the big city bikes even outside outside this hotel. Bicing is from Barcelona, Spain. And I think the bison was actually bigger before COVID. So I think the numbers have gone down for some reason. Um, Toronto is a big one. And Capital Bike Share Lyft, they are from Washington, D.C., I believe. And you can see they have equal numbers because the Washington, D.C. is mandating the kind of the numbers. Um, Bay Wheels, I believe that might be San Francisco. San Francisco. Yes. So uh, we can hear see also the United States, Canada, France are heavy, very heavy users of GPS speed. And here we have kind of example of the biggest dock on on the bike show system, and that's found on New York City by city bike. Um, the biggest station has more than 100 shared bikes in one single location. And if you look at the upper graph, it shows the distribution of the, of the dock capacity in New York City. So you can see most of the docks have about 20 to, to 30. Bikes, but there are some very, very big, big capacity as well. This one is actually an important number because if you want to do predictions, if your number's capacity is very low, if you are predicting between 0 and 10, predictions are not going to be that accurate. But if you have a larger, larger capacity, predictions are kind of more informative. Here is also one kind of interesting diagram. This is from Denver. And I believe this was from 2020. It shows the e-bike battery charging levels. So the more darker red color you have, that one has less battery left on the e-bike. And this is something which is going to be quite kind of more important because the e-bikes are getting more share right now instead of the traditional bikes. So this is something that you can also find on GPF speed. And here are some examples of the of the GPFS2 version 2 standard, what additional data you can get. So nowadays you can also for a system who is using the newer version, you can get um, vehicle types. And currently, out of about six, more than 600 systems, about half of them are using already GPFS2 feeds, which is more, more kind of content, including the vehicle types. And as you can see, most of these systems producing the vehicle types, they are cycle bikes, and almost the same number also provide scooters, and mopeds are appearing. So this means that it's not anymore about the bikes. Scooters are quite big one, and now kind of the new modes, alternative modes are appearing on GD GPFS. And cars, that's kind of surprising. That's a shared car. So that one is appearing as well. I don't know what the other mean. <laughs> Some unknown vehicle. Maybe it is one of the self-driving cars. Maybe. Who knows? And if you look at the proposal type, 
um, electric vehicles are kind of getting more dominant. The electric assist means the e-bikes, where you actually have to do some active mobility, but you will get some assistance from the electricity. And the human bikes are actually surprisingly small. If you look at I was surprised at this number. And the combustion, I don't know, that might be cars. Moped, that's, that's right. It might be moped indeed. I don't actually know how big the move is now for systems to include this information, but this is very kind of important to include. Do you have any kind of knowledge on how systems are updating the versions? A lot of them update depending on um, the regulation, the local regulation. And so if local regulators are requiring an updated version, they would have to update. Um, but not very many are updating by choice. Um, but now that more um, trip planning applications are starting to include shared mobility, they want to be displayed in those applications. And sometimes there are requirements there as well, um, such as including the form factor. So it's, it's, it's coming up but there are definitely still a lot of systems that are still on version one. Yeah, and of course you need to have kind of people who can actually do the upgrade and you need to allocate time and testing so it's not trivial to do the updates. And if you are starting up, then of course you should go to the latest version immediately. Uh, let's look at the demo after going through all of these slides so we can see from different angles. Um, here is another kind of viewpoint into the data, which is the forecasting. So you can actually actually forecast on the previous history what happens happens with the availability. And here the interesting thing is that each this is again with the bike shared bikes with the dogs, so it's possible to predict for each dog that what is the availability, for example, within the next three hours, based on the historical behavior. The interesting thing is that each dog has their own life cycle, if you will, so they are different depending where do you live, or actually where where the dock is located. Here is an example from Turku. This is in Finland. This is actually taken during the winter time. Turku has year-round cycling season. And it's plus five Celsius. I believe this is around 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So I guess Montreal, that would be pretty cold weather. But still, you can see the capacity, these are five different stations, and you can see the upper one, it's a residential area. There are lots of bikes during early hours. The numbers go down when people are going to work, and then when they return back to the residential areas, you can see the numbers are increasing because the, they are getting the bikes, bikes to their homes. The second station is a kind of downtown of city, and you can see that people are going to work. So the numbers are opposite. So if you look at the capacity, it's kind of opposite way. Third one is a railway station close to the university, and it's kind of a bit not so predictable because people come and go and there are different activities around the station so you can't really predict. So it's kind of, yes please. Uh, for the, the university example, um, are you able to notice any trends on days of the week? Yes. Does Monday to Friday match yes. the next week? Uh, and then can you come up, can you build that into your model still? Yeah, this is a very good question. <laughs> Uh, each day is different, Monday through Friday, and for any station, Monday to Friday are typically more similar compared to the weekends. 
and it very much depends on what kind of area it is. If it's um, a traffic junction like railway station or a big metro station, it has different different kind of cycle compared to the residential area. And even the weather affects. So if it's rainy, rainy day, people may not want to take a bike to go into the world. Or not that much as, as with very extreme weather. We have done some some comparisons on, on the weather data and there is a clear effect, especially yeah, the more sun you have, especially on weekends, people take likes to go and move around. So here are kind of a few examples what you can do with the GPFS speeds, but now let's look at what things we have encountered when actually consuming and things which could be improved for GPFS produ by GPFS producer. Uh, one thing is that the API for a GPFS suite may not be responding. So here, what would help is to have a status page, which you can actually check that is the feed up and running nicely. And this example is from France. This example was actually also shown earlier today with the open data for mobility data validation. So, it's, it's found from, if you go to Government France website, you can go and see, see these status pages for a number of feeds. So, this is really a wonderful thing to have if you want to use the data, because then you can see that if there are some issues, you can go to the status page and see that, okay, there were some some downtime. And sometimes if you want to look at what's happening, you might have to contact the feed producer, and this is what happened. Some time ago, I sent a message to one of the GPFS data producers. There was some issue with the data, and I got this kind of message back. I understand that it says, Hello, Maria. Are you good? Are you well? And I realized bilingua, it means something with the language. This is Portuguese. This is from Brazil. So I have to translate. What does it say? It says that we appreciate your contact, but we don't have bilingual customer service. So I have to try to translate the very technical question. I never got any answer back. <laughs> so this is something to consider as if you are producing data, especially API data, and for consumers, you should kind of think about that. How do you handle the, this is kind of the developer support. You have the customer support, which is for end users, but for developers consuming the data, you should actually have a developer support. And since mobility data is global, there are no borders, your consumers might be outside your own country, you should actually hopefully kind of be able to answer, hopefully in English, English but luckily the trans translators are very good so you can deal with it. Another thing which you might encounter is that winter, so this picture was taken in April in Finland. The cycling season started in April 1st. This, these bikes were already working, but they were, if you look at the data, you can see that it's zero, nothing. No bikes are arriving. And that was because they were not be able to install the docks because of the ice and snow. So now the question is that, how do you produce the data? Do you stop the data? Do you say capacity is zero, no bikes? Or, or do you say capacity is, for example, 20, but no bikes? So how do you communicate that this is winter, there is no service? 
flowing to the snow. This is something which is not happening in every every place, but for cold weather or countries with cold weather, this is daily life. Uh, another interesting fact is that there is data for customer service in in the GPFS feeds, and if you would like to use the feeds to integrate to your own end user facing applications, you might have to contact the customer service for that specific system. And the systems are providing phone numbers, but if you look at here, what is the first number? I don't know which country. I recognize the one with the phone, old-fashioned phone. <laughs> it's plus 42, that's actually an international um, area code, so that's a kind of valid way to set up an international phone number. As well as the plus 32, that's, I believe, that's Belgium. So, this is something to consider when you produce data that it's good to follow the standards. And there is a standard, it's an ITU, International Telecommunication Union Standard. So, that's something that should be enforced by, by the data validators in the format. There is a similar thing which is maybe a bit bigger issue that when you have the GPFS data feed, if you only work with one single system, the system identifier doesn't matter at all. But if you work with multiple systems, you are aggregating data, then the system identifier should be globally unique. And here we have Okay, this is more than 600 systems in total. A handful of them have duplicate data. And this is also something which maybe need, needs governance across the systems so that how do you represent the system so that it's unique globally. Um, the UUID numbers, the long, long strings are one way to go, but that's not very human. -y. Readable. So, the identifier, I believe there is a natural session on, about identifiers, so hopefully there is some solution for, for this thing. So, yes, please. Does it still use this uh, domain name as an ID? Because Could a system use a domain name as an ID? Yeah, domain name would work for operator. But if you think about that one operator, let's take next bike okay. or tier in, that's not doesn't help for the actual system because you might have 50 systems around the world. It might be actually a combination if you have a domain name and in front of it a subdomain, that would work. And that would be actually quite a nice way of identifying. But why does the GPFS Specification does not provide uh, a unique way to, to define the name. I would have expected as a standard to define, okay, you should put okay, I don't find that this way. This is an excellent question, and this is maybe something for kind of to take into account when making the specification may be a bit slightly strict because the identifier is really the key thing. And it's also if you are contacting one operator who has tens of systems, how do you say that which system are you contacting about? I mean, you can say which city and, but even city names, you have same cities in multiple countries, so that one doesn't help either. So the thing is that mobility really doesn't have any borders. So that's something to think about, even if you are working with local data, who is consuming the data might be in 
on totally opposite side of the of the globe. So let's let's take a look at now a demo and let's start with so yes please. I have a question that may be related to your last point. Yes. Uh, it, it, it looks like the systems are all individual systems have their own individual identity. Yes. Are there services that um, combine all of their systems in one feed so that you know, it, there's no way to know that a new system has been added, but you can know when a new location uh, has been, if it's all in one feed you know, and, and uh, a new system Starts up in a system starts up in a new city. Uh, there are vehicles there, and if it's all one feed, then you just know that there that there are now vehicles in a location where they previously weren't. There's, <coughs> excuse me. There's no way to know that if each system is its own system. You don't know when a new system that is a new city um, has uh, started their operations. Yeah. There is something which helps that you will actually find out if a new system has been, is following the GPFS. So there is some systems that CSV, that's kind of currently the way how you can, it's kind of a catalog of the systems. Yes. That's, that's one way. There's no way for that. I mean, I suppose you could write a script of some sort that tells you you know, that compares, that gives, looks at the CSV, downloads the CSV, looks at it every week or every day, and identifies differences between the two. But that seems kind of convoluted. Uh, it seems like they're, with, with GTFS, yes, when yes. an agency updates its speed, you know, there's an expiration date. So you know you can create a, you know, a, an automated process that looks for the expiration date and then goes back to that same URL, downloads the new updated GTFS feed. But with GBFS systems, when a new system is added or when a system has been removed. That's even more kind of interesting when yeah. something is removed. It's a very, so either way, it's a, it's a very practical problem. I don't know if you know, this has come up at all, you've seen it. Uh, is there a solution to that? Uh, so it has come up. Um, the problem is, for GBFS, people are not so benevolent as they are in GTFS to share their data. And so when a new system comes up, there are aggregation services that exist, um, but typically those things are happening behind closed doors. And typically the aggregation services are aggregating data that's not open. And so we only know of open systems and open data that's what exists in systems.csv, um, and that's all we can put. And so we do, you know, we monitor newsletters that, and announce new services, and then we try to find the URL if we can. You know, if you're thinking of this service for each city, they use the local airport code, for example. We can find their URL, and we just start typing in all the various airport codes. And it's not the most efficient system, but that's all we have right now. The goal, and we had a workshop on this this morning, is to understand how we can have more community contributions to that database. And they're on the transit side, we're working on the mobility database. And the dream is one day to have something very similar for GBFS where people are happy to submit their data to us. But right now, we have to find it. Okay, so let's go. But, but I can say that the situation is actually Pretty good in the sense that I, maybe two years ago, it was about 200 systems. Now it's more than 600 systems. Yeah. But I can say already that maybe 30 of them are not, which are listed on the systems, so CSD are not responding. Which means that this, either the feed is doesn't exist anymore or the URL is not correct. A, a, a difference between Micromobility and transit is that micromobility services come and go. Transit agencies don't come and go. Exactly. So, you know, once you've uh, you know integrated with the GTFS feed, you, you can you can rely on it. Yes. I mean, the 
transness, there isn't suddenly not going to be a TM service in Montreal. Actually, this is a very good point you was taking out because it also depends in some countries. For example, in Finland, the cities might be changing the data, the transportation provider, and then you have a different feed. Even if it would be GPFS, it might be from different URLs, so it's not tied to the city, but it's tied to the actual data well, producer. That's exactly my point. Yes. That it yes. can be very fluid and therefore unstable from a data management. Yeah. You understand that? Yes. So actually, that's, it's related to your question when you said that how do you identify a system? Because if there was a, let's say, a proxy, proxy in front of the actual feed so that you would just have the city, you could, that might help with this one, even if the actual system providing the feed might be changing underneath. Yeah, that yeah. may not be feasible, but still that's the same thing that the systems come and go. Right. I guess that's a that is a proxy for kind of it's a it's, it's a way to unify many different feeds under a common. Or even one one even for one city, you could say that this city provides shared bikes. Uh, the transportation provider might change underneath, but it would be still producing GPFS feed. Even that would be one step ahead. Yeah. Is that something under consideration? So. Not yet. If you'd like to open an issue. You, the, uh, yes, you have our GitHub. You can go open an issue on GitHub. Yes. We have another question here. Uh, just a remark or comment. Uh, it's not only a technical issue, it's also a regulatory issue. Mm -hmm. Operators have the obligation to share the data and to document it. And in Europe, you have national access points that are kind of registries to document every fit. Uh, I would say that for car sharing, bike sharing, it's still like expanding, it's fairly new. Whereas for transit, it's already well, well advanced. But it means that many countries in Europe, you would find a registry with a list of all your fees, uh, even when it's changing because it's a legal requirement. And also more and more cities um, maybe that's why we, we found that there were more bike sharing on uh, systems. Uh, there are a, a requirement to share this data as part of a, a contract with cities. And it might also be the case uh, in the US, but more and more, well, it's, it's a contract that says that they were publish this GBFS feed. Uh, and at least in Europe, it's a, it would be the registry in the national <laughs> So it might solve part of the issue. But if you don't have this framework, probably it's more difficult to find the fit. Exactly. There is some kind of a way in Europe, for, uh, sorry, in EU to, to make kind of the catalogs more easily available. So that's with the national access points, NAPs, but that's still at the country level and that depends on country how actively these access points are acting and collecting the, even the data what's available. And France is, for example, very active on these national access points as well as the Nordic countries. But this is gradually coming in in Europe, in place. But I also saw something about this. It was a good question. So if you look at United States, you can see, let's pick, for example, Chicago. You can see there are four systems in Chicago because the city is mandating. Mandating for, for the producers to kind of even produce the same amount of capacity. So if we look here, I think, okay, this is lift scooters, Divi scooters, no, not Divi, shared bikes, and line. It's, there is no data, but at least we know that there is a line in 
in Chicago. So if you look at this number, 17,000, it's the same number as, as here. So the cities are demanding. And I don't know how the bidding works, but I think it's a regular ongoing process. In Europe, you have a huge number of systems. And let's take the Norway example, because Norway is, a, as a country, it mandates that the shared bike scooters should share their data with the GPFS. So you can see here, okay, this is a very, this is Oslo, the capital. Capital, you have to, okay, tier is, we don't have the capacity, but we know that tier is operating in in Oslo as well as Oslo Busykel is the shared bike system in Oslo. This is fairly big, or close to 6,000 shared bikes. Uh, by the way, this number is increasing because when I was preparing this presentation, it was 400, uh, 490 and it's now 502. And if we take all the systems this number includes 40 countries for GPFS data with shared bikes, scooters, and free floating bikes, and 367 cities. So it's a pretty massive <laughs> number of micromobility. And if we look at, let's look at biggest systems. If we take the systems which have closed at minimum 100 stations, you can see that the capacity is pretty large too. So there are huge systems with the New York City bike with close to 50,000 bikes, and then you have a number of very, very small systems. So very, very different around the world. And let's look at by this actually shows the, how the different systems are distributed by country and city. And you can see the US is dominating. This is now the number of shared bikes, the capacity. Uh, red one is France. Paris is the biggest in, in Europe. UK is quite... Sorry, Canada. Canada is the green one, and fourth one is Spain. Are there any cities you would like to see in particular? What's the what's the counts? Should we do Montreal? Yeah, let's look at the Montreal. So here is Canada and Bixi. Montreal is here. And Bix is the only system with 16,000 bikes. Just this quick dot was Can you say it again? So does it include docked bikes and free floating? Uh, uh, free this floating? one is now for docked bikes. For all yeah. No scooters. Uh, no scooters. Uh, the systems here are also with the scooters, but the capacity looks like zero. So you have very thin slices for lime and and lift scooters. So New York would only show city bike. Uh, yes, let's check. Yeah, city bike, forty-nine thousand bikes. Oh, I want to show something which was actually surprising. Uh, Great Britain didn't show up until very recently, and now there are much, much more shared bike activity in Great Britain, especially since during the COVID, even the, even the bike lanes have been added. The same thing has happened in, in Paris, Brussels, and I believe also in the United States and Canada. So that's good. good for cycling so that actually the infrastructure is changing and that one is showing up in these numbers. 
Okay, I want to show some examples of the data quality. Quality, this is really based on the data, these, all of these numbers. And you can see that you should actually have the location, but we have a location DE, which means um, Germany. So there are kind of, some systems are not tied to specific city, but they are distributed in large areas, and that's why you can't get the actual location. Wow, and Paris has over 8,000 stations? Yes. Yeah, let's Are look at... Small stations, or... That's a good... Let's... On the chart of the, the fleet, I don't think it was very high, was it? Uh, um, Paris has 45,000 bikes, and they have over 8,000 stations. And by the way, this number is bigger now because uh, during the winter, I think it was like 4,500 or 4,300. Now it's over 8,000. That actually explains some of the, why the increase has happened so rapidly because I was looking, preparing the slides two weeks ago and I think like 20,000 bikes has been added. It's, it's surprising, surprising. And let's actually look at, we can look at the Paris also. So this one is actually the big city, Montreal, Montreal and something we discussed today, today was that the cities have different kind of way how the streets are designed. For example, Montreal, even if the city is old, the streets are very kind of in a grid format. And you can actually see it here with the bike stations. Because if you look some other cities with very kind of different type of layout, the bike stations are of course around the cities, around the streets, and they look very different. So if you look here, Montreal, so you can see the grid just from the spots. The bigger spot or bubble, the bigger capacity is available. So this one is one with, actually capacity is 34, but there are actually 52 bikes now on this one particular station. And if you look, look the capacity per station, you can see 50, 20, 25, 30. Those are the most common sizes for the dogs. But we should actually now look at the Paris because that's a good example with a large number of dogs, but maybe slightly smaller amounts for individuals. So let's look at. Okay, here um, it's 45,000 bikes. And currently around four. 14,000 bikes are available, kind of free to take. So the rest of the bikes are in actually in use. This one actually shows a small number of bike stations. So I'm actually now wondering the data. So that's something to check that where is the discrepancy now on the data. But if we look at here, Paris is a very large city, and uh, you can see there are lots of lots of bike stations. It might be easier to look here. You can see the streets are not so grid-like because it's a very old city, and and the cities were grown differently, but. You can see that there are a lot of stations. And this is, for example, even close to the Louvre, you have the bikes. Right? 67 bike is the capacity. And let's look at the capacity numbers. So you can see compared to Montreal that they are slightly smaller now, sizes regarding the capacity. Um, is there some other city you would like to look at? Maybe New York, just to Yeah, let's, let's, let's look at, yeah. 
Yeah, actually, we can see the difference that the capacity is slightly larger than in Paris. Okay, and, uh, yeah, the numbers were not that different, but still, let's see. Yeah, here you have the Manhattan and, and the bikes are, you can see they are fairly large stations. And if you look at the capacity, the distribution is different. You have much, much more for these large stations. And New York is a good example for bike sharing because it's a flat land and direct streets. That one affects a lot how much the people are actually using the shared bikes. So let's take still a quick look on the forecast and see that how does the forecast work. I have an example here. So this one is a uh, city of Helsinki and Espo is also included in this system. So this one shows kind of where the bike stations are, are distributed. And Helsinki has Helsinki and Espoo together has about 400 stations, so it's um, about 4,000 bikes. So it's a very, very small system compared to the previous ones. The time in Helsinki is now midnight. And this one actually shows, because this one is the downtown, this is the central station of Helsinki. You can see that there are no bikes now here. This, people have gone home and nobody is in the city centre. And you can see now the forecast, it's midnight. <laughs> ah, you are right, you are right, because this is the time when the sun doesn't go down very briefly, so that's a good, good point. But here is an example that during the daytime, the bikes really are arriving because people go to work. And if we take a natural... Okay, I will show an extreme place. Okay, this one, this is an area where you have only offices. And there is an energy station there, so it's almost empty now. Yeah, one, one bike left. And here you can see that people are going quite early in the mornings to this office area and they are leaving work. And this is actually one of the biggest areas in, in Helsinki for the shared bikes because people, there are no public transportation in this area. So, or it's one half kilometer to the next metro station. So this is a nice place for shared bikes. So now I would like to actually open the floor for questions, because now we have seen kind of how the GPFS data can be used from different angles. And we have also gone through some of the things which would be good to take into account if you are producing GPFS feeds. But do you have any questions? Yes. So given that GBFS is real time, where do you get the historical data? Are you saving GBFS feeds every hour? Where are you, get, where are you saving all of the data? Where are you getting the historical data? Um, for those cities where we have the forecasts, we are fetching data on a frequent basis to build the forecasts. And the forecast, it's actually built on machine learning models and and there are quite many models because each station has their own kind of life cycle. They are very different. So that's how it is done for selected cities we built the forecast. And are you um, fetching from systems.csv or are you fetching from somewhere else? Um, it's a combination. So the starting point is the GFP and the systems.csv, but um, it doesn't work so that you will fetch it and then you automatically pick up because not the, all the feeds are working out of the box. You have to actually do some 
if there are some new feeds, you have to see that does it comply, comply with the standard, are there any problems, some feeds are very slow to answer, for example, the response time is very slow, for example, there was an issue in, in some Canadian systems a few weeks ago that the time, timeouts were too long, so it's a, like a curated set of feeds initially based on the systems, yes. Uh, when you talk about the, um, the difference in the forecasting models from station to station, um, are, are these, is this similar to the forecasting models that the companies use to move their fleet around and they know where the, the, where the demand is going to be and that's where they move the bikes? Is, it, uh, it, is there like a, an accepted standard model that the companies stick to or do they all develop their own? Or? That's a very good question. The, these uh, forecasts are meant for the traveler who wants to actually see that where should I find and when should, can I find a bike. And the forecasts done for, for, for example, for the fleet managing companies, they could use very similar models, but they have a different viewpoints. But underneath, I believe it's actually very similar. I'm serious. Yeah, it's always, it's always built on past data. Yes, data. because you have kind of the historical, historical data, but how it is actually integrated with the operations is definitely different. And so what are some use cases um, like for this data or who comes to you for this kind of information at Avista? Uh, to use this data. Yeah, like who are your, like what what are your clients doing with the data? What 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 is the use case? Uh, one of the use cases is really the the riders who would like to see, especially if you are going to a new place, you don't know. Are there typically bikes, for example, if I have to go to a meeting, which is outside my normal area, it's actually nice to check that. Do I find bikes when I'm leaving the meeting? Or if you regularly go every morning to your job, it may you actually know that is it typically that I can find a bike, but if you are not going on your normal surroundings, then it's and also tra travelers who are going to New City. For example, here, if you want to use the bikes and see that do I have a bike when I come back from my shopping, for example? That's kind of from the traveler's point of view, but the same data indeed can be used by, or similar forecasts can be used by the fleet managers. And it's actually, if you look at the time series, you can see sometimes that the fleet has been kind of increased, so new bikes have been added to the dock. So there is an, if it's a flat, you can see a spike and you know that bikes have been included and moved around. Do you have B2B or B2B clients for setups that want to analyze the data, make compile between cities, for instance, and learn from it? We are a startup, so we are looking for more clients who could use, but we have had pilots with cities. For example, the forecast model was worked together with the, with the city of Helsinki and Espoo. For instance, if I was a startup yes. and I wanted to go to a city, uh, your data would be useful to me. Yes. Can I find yes. access to the data? Uh, we are a company, so this kind of, this is a curated data. So this one it's not, at least not right now, open. It's not open, but, but do you sell it as a service? Yes, yes. Because many citizen companies could be interested in paying for accessing. Yeah, we are happy to talk with, <laughs> with these companies and cities. And what's actually surprising is that the data really changes. 
So even the seasons change and they affect the data because during the summertime you will get more bikes actually installed and in use. And during the winter times some services stop. So this is really dynamic data. <coughs> Maybe you mentioned before, I arrived at right to uh, the operator doesn't have the TBS fit, but like an API or something else. Uh, do you integrate this data? Yes, we have also integrated data which is not only GPFS. But of course, we would hope that everybody would be using GPFS because it's really, really a good standard. And it's also a well-maintained standard and something which is expanded. So, of course, I actually wanted to have a slide which says I heart GPFS, but I thought it would be too cheesy. <laughs> but really, it's a wonderful standard if you, yeah, and especially it's a large adaptation as well. And I think it's a, also possible because the Micromobility is a really new kind of technology as well, so it's possible to start using the standards for train systems, subways. The systems are, have been running for many, many years, and it's not so easy to start adopting new standards. So, so that's why kind of this one also shows that if you have newer systems, new technology, if you will, you can actually adopt a standard, and quite rapidly too. And of course, GPFS is quite in the limited or focused that it's still possible to do it. It's a few fields and very well defined, a few fields in, in the fields. Are there any other questions? Um, yeah, uh, I'm very new to to GPFS, uh, yeah. I work more GTFS, and I work with the Regional Transportation Authority in Montreal. And we're, we're always interested in, right now we're really trying to understand better what's happening in the network, what are people's patterns. Uh, we're trying to better measures of trips that change modes. And very, we're starting a project soon with Big C where we're gonna be having more access to Big C's data. So, uh, my question, I guess, if you had, have you seen studies where this has been used in conjunction for identifying, you know, uh, people dropping off a big volume of bikes near a transit hub? Does that, can, can you translate that into a proxy for ridership or do, do you know how many, when someone drops off a bike, do they continue on public transit or is it, does the ride finish there? I'm wondering if you have any experience with studies that try to join the two data sets together. This is a very good question because um, that would mean that you would have to know that person's movements and then it goes against the privacy thing. For example, GPFS is wonderful in the sense that it doesn't include any yes. privacy data. So it's kind of a safe standard and safe standard to adopt, but you can't track individual movement. So that kind of scenario is not possible. But we can see from the data that if you have a lot of overfield docks, that one is is seen and we can also see, for example, in Helsinki places where you have too big capacity and they could be reduced by twenty bikes. So that they would be placed in a in a places where you actually or dogs could be placed where you have this overfilled capacity. There are quite many things you can see from the data. Yeah. Especially if you start comparing the stations, you can put them in order, different order. For example, what are the minimum capacity or minimum availability always? What are, are they always, always 30 bikes? Then it means that you can take 20 off from the capacity without affecting the usability. Or if you always have empty, empty spots, it means that you should actually stock more. Yeah. So that can be seen in the data, and we have done this kind of analysis as well.
We have about 10 minutes left, so I'm not sure if there's anything else you wanted to cover or if there are any other questions. We can always end early and, you know, everybody go get some coffee before everybody else gets out. Um, I want to thank you for speaking on our shared mobility stage. It is small but humble and mighty at the same time. Um, and I'm, I'm so happy that you could come and visit us all the way from Finland. Um, and we're so happy to have you here and to learn all about Avista. Thank you so much for your attention and very good questions and discussions. Thank you very much.